Now you're as far back as your memory can go. Can you still see yourself? Yes. Imagine having a second chance at life. Reincarnation. Living again. No more death. Can the soul be carried to another body? Can we remember our past lives? And how does science deal with these ideas? Enter the fifth dimension and unravel the secrets of reincarnation. For millions of people, reincarnation is an accepted fact. They believe when they die, their souls move on to return in another body. We are making huge strides in unlocking the secrets of memory and brain. But for scientists, the soul is a difficult concept. It's very hard to scientifically prove anything uh, that uh, is related to what is a soul. Can this child really be the dead wife of this man? And the mother of a boy her own age? Can this girl carry the spirit of a dead teenager? How can they remember their past lives? But I do believe that um, reincarnation should be taken seriously. There are many strange stories of people claiming to remember earlier lives that at first glance defy explanation. Benares, northern India. The holy river Mother Ganges flows through the city. Hinduism is one of the world's oldest religions with millions of followers. For them, life does not always end in death. Along the banks, funeral pyres for the dead. Only immersing the ashes in the river will release the soul from the cycle of rebirth and suffering in this world. Karma is the Hindu law that controls reincarnation and our places on the ladder of existence. Good deeds will be rewarded, bad punished, giving everyone a chance to redeem themselves. The priests believe it offers comfort. Who can count the sunbeams? The sun is a source of endless beings. There are so many souls. The light begins to die, but their souls come back again and again. Thousands of tales of reincarnation exist in India. On the 11th of December 1926, a girl is born in Delhi. For Hindus, she was to become living proof of their beliefs. Her name was Shanti Devi. Until the age of four, she never spoke. When she did, her first words were explosive. She told her mother that her home was not in Delhi, but in a town called Matra, 140 kilometers away. She had lived there in her past life. Her name was Lugdi, and her husband was a man called Kedanat Chobe. Shanti was able to describe the town in astonishing detail, even though she had never been there. She could even remember how she died. 
giving birth to her son seven years earlier. For two years, Shanti's parents dismissed her words as fantasy. In the end, her mother decided she could no longer ignore her daughter's vivid descriptions. So one of Shanti's uncles traveled to Matra to investigate her claims. What he found seemed to confirm her story. There was a cloth maker living in the town. His wife, Lubdi, had died in childbirth the year before Shanti Devi was born. His name was Kedanat Chobe. Was Shanti, his wife, reborn? Dr. Ravat is one of India's leading specialists on reincarnation. He has spent much of his life retracing Shanti's story and recalls Kedanath's first encounter with her. When Kedanath came to Delhi, and there were a lot of people very curious to know whether Shanti had been talking all nonsense or is there is truth in it. But when in the morning, Kedanath very openly and clearly stated that uh, I'm 100% convinced she's Lubdi. The whole thing spread like fire and hundreds and hundreds of people used to come to see this child. In the 1930s, India was in turmoil as the country struggled for independence from British rule. Hindus and Muslims clashed violently. Mahatma Gandhi, a Hindu, was seeking a peaceful solution. He moved Devi's story centre stage in the wider struggle. At the same time, India has many people from many other regions also. They said that it is, the whole story is a propaganda done by Hindus in order to promote their religion. In 1935, Gandhi asked for Shanti Devi to be brought to him. Shanti told me when she was narrating her incidences that she still remembered, even at the age of 62, that she, she, was, uh, she felt the bones of Gandhi when she was sitting in his lap. For Hindus, she was living proof that their laws controlled human destiny. But as a belief system, it has its critics. Even inside India, many don't accept karma or reincarnation. Sanal Idamaku of the Indian Rationalist Society is one. I have been personally involved in studying hundreds of cases of reincarnation and I am convinced that all these cases that I have been exposed to were absolutely fake, hoax, or sometimes simple mental cases. For Sanal, the need for reincarnation doesn't lie with the rebirth of the soul or pondering on a past life. He looks to Indian society for the answers. To be born a Hindu in India is to be born into a caste, a system as rigid as stone. For over 1,500 years, it's followed one basic rule, that all men are created unequal. Brahmins sit at the very top of the ladder. At the bottom are the untouchables. To explain the enduring power of reincarnation, this is where Sanal believes we should start. The fundamental concept of reincarnation tells you a very wrong thing. Whatever life situation that you have in this life is the gaining of you. It is the gaining of you from the last incarnation. If you have done good deeds in the last birth, you get better life here. 
If you, if you are an untouchable, if you are a poor person, if you don't have money, if you don't have job, if your situations are bad, that's because you have done some sins in the last life. That takes away the sense of enterprising in people. People are lethargic. Ask many Indians in the villages. They say that my faith is written on my forehead. They would say. It cannot be changed. It's karma. It's fate. You cannot change it. It's all predestined. That, that's the concept of reincarnation. That's one of the major reasons that our people are not coming up, going forward. By 1935, Shanti's story was a national sensation, and Gandhi appointed a commission to investigate her claims. A team of politicians, scientists, and journalists took Shanti to Matra. Their aim was to test the nine-year-old's knowledge of the town and people. Would Shanti pass? When the team arrived in Matra, they were astonished by how much the child knew. She answered many questions correctly, although several she got wrong. But she was able to describe the holy gates of the city before they reached them. She could point out new buildings and streets, which she claimed did not exist in the past. Shanti's brother, Viresh Narain, accompanied her on the journey. He remembers it as if it were yesterday. She told the way. She showed the way. You have to go that way. And now they are like that. And she guided the team to the home of her previous life. Outside the cloth maker's shop, Shanti Devi met Namanda Bay who would have been her sister in her past life. She recognized me straight away. There were so many people, they were pushing her away from me, but she recognized everything. She knew of each lane, where it led to, knew every tenant, knew where they lived. She recognized the cobbler, the washer, all of them. The trip culminated in a dramatic encounter. Nine-year-old Shanti met 10-year-old Navneet, the son she died giving birth to. Mother and son meet for the first time. They pointed at me and asked Shanti Devi, who is that? And she said, that is my son. How did you recognize him? She said, my soul has recognized his soul, and she began to cry. For the commission, this was final proof. Their report concluded that if science and religion could meet on a common ground together, they could unlock the miracle of reincarnation. The case is of worldwide importance with direct effect on mankind. We ask all scientists to help us find a conclusion. But what could science contribute to such an unscientific debate? In America, the McGovern Institute for Brain Research tries to unlock the mysteries of human memory. Nobel Prize winner Professor Philip Sharp heads up the unit. The soul, in many cases, has an implication related to religion or uh, good and bad, uh, and uh, a uh, existence beyond the physical uh, organism. And uh, it's very hard to scientifically prove anything uh, that uh, is related to what is a soul. What is a difficult concept for a scientist is accepted as a simple truth for millions around the globe. For Namanda Bay, 
Her sister's soul had been reborn in a new body, but she was the same person. I was so happy that I found my sister again after her death, almost as if I gained a new sister. I was happy, more than happy. But then she went back to Delhi. It was as if I was going to lose her a second time. I was left sad, very sad. Consciousness clearly comes or is shaped by culture in, in many ways and the people we interact with and the, the environment we have. Uh, so it, it's hard to say in a biological sense what consciousness is. In 1987, Shanti Devi died at the age of 62. Four days before her death, she gave her final interview to Dr. Ravat. What do you expect from your future? I think that I will reach salvation in the future. Everybody has to go through the highs and lows of birth and rebirth. With this life, the cycle ends. I will go to God in my next life. Hundreds of scholars, investigators, critics, writers, journalists went to her, questioned her to the extent that right from the almost the day she started talking about past life till I know of the four days before her death when I had last interviewed her. This is the work of God. God made me his tool. This is all God's play. And the world is the stage. And we all dance as he wants us to. It says in the Holy Scriptures that reincarnation exists. My mother proved it and showed everyone that there is such a thing as rebirth. She was living proof, and all those people who didn't believe in it had to accept that there is a reincarnation. But one year after Shanti's death, disturbing new evidence came to light. Kedanat Chobe, Shanti's alleged husband, had paid regular visits to Delhi. These visits could cast doubt on Shanti's claims. His trips to the capital regularly took him to a shop opposite her family home. Is it possible that young Shanti could have overheard Kedanath's conversations about his life in Matra and subconsciously absorbed the knowledge? You cannot underestimate the power of suggestion, <laughs> uh, uh, inadvertent suggestion conversations in a hall, uh, a parent telling a story, uh, you know, a, a member of the community talking around a, uh, 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 a gathering at some time. Children are a, a tabla rosa. They, they are totally uh, receptive to uh, suggestions. The human organism is an extraordinarily responsive entity, and any suggestion and molding and response from the questioner can be used to shape one's thoughts, maybe subconsciously, maybe not with uh, even awareness that uh, that's going on. Ultimately, my conclusion is Shanti Devi's case is strong, yet it has weaknesses. the University of Charlottesville in Virginia. Here in the Personality Studies Division, modern science is coming head to head with the mystical beliefs of reincarnation. The unit tries to establish hard evidence of the truths behind the stories such as Devi's. They use the information to assess the potential applications in understanding the human personality. Its founder is psychologist Professor Ian Stevenson. For over 40 years, he has traveled the world tracking down those children who claim to be able to recall a past life. 
Over this long period, he believes that a significant pattern has emerged in many countries. Individually, the cases of these little children seemed uh, weak, but um, when you looked at them as a whole, they uh, showed me uh, certain uniformities. Very young age of the ch children, two to five, and then the tendency for the children to forget when they were seven or eight. What began as a personal interest developed into a fully funded research project, which is still struggling to find the truth. There are over 2,000 cases of alleged rebirth from around the world in Stevenson's filing system, but incontrovertible proof is hard to pin down. Well, the conclusion so far is that um, for the strongest cases, uh, reincarnation is the best but not the only explanation. We don't have any perfect case. They all have some flaw. And uh, so there's, uh, I've never claimed we have anything like a proof of reincarnation. But I do believe that um, reincarnation should be taken seriously as a possible explanation. Stevenson cross-checks all available details of the children's stories, but he also looks for physical signs, traces of the violent deaths from which many of the children claim to have died. A small number of the birthmarks are uh, very similar in appearance to birthmarks that nearly everybody has, uh, what we call um, melanocytic nevi. Uh, but the, most of the birthmarks that um, I and my colleagues have described are much more substantial. Stevenson has collected over 600 of these cases. A little girl from Turkey. She claims to remember that her husband killed her in her former life by cutting her head off. Across her throat, she has a faint red birthmark. There's the little boy from Sri Lanka. He says he was killed by a shot in the head. And this is the wound. And a boy from India who died in a car crash that crushed his leg. In many cases, we've been able to verify the existence of the wounds with post-mortem reports, which are very precious. And we need more of that. In order to gather more evidence and follow up leads, Stevenson has installed a global network of researchers on standby around the world. In 2003, in southern Turkey, a curious case came to light. German psychologist Dr. Jürgen Keil went to investigate. Under circumstances that I would call good, the child was able to give me information that, in my opinion, could not possibly have come from her current life. I would, therefore, call it a case that is above average. In 1998, a young Turkish girl, Atra Kapi, died of brain injuries in a car crash in her home of Atakya. Twenty-eight days later, in another Turkish village not far away, Demet Yildiri was born. This child had a birthmark that has now faded, and we certainly can't say that it was definitely connected to the accident, but it is the same place where Atra was fatally injured. At the family home, Kyle meets Demet and her grandmother, Kesben Yildiri. She is absolutely convinced by her grandchild's story. 
Demet said from the beginning that she had two mothers and she even knew the name of her mother from her past life. Lemia. Why do you have two mothers, I asked her. But she insisted on it, and the first time she even said a name, Lemia. I knew a Lemia, she was a tailor, and I had my clothes made by her. I had not mentioned any of this to Demet, and all of a sudden she asked, Grandma, what is sewing? I was astounded, by Allah, and asked myself how on earth she would have known about that. Such conviction from a family makes unravelling the truth complicated. At London University, psychologist Chris French works on the paranormal. He recognizes the difficulty of getting objective evidence in these situations. If we look at some of the specific cases of children who've apparently remembered past lives, then I think there is some evidence to suggest that in some of those cases, the role has been taken on by the child in response to unintentional cueing from the parents and maybe even from some researchers. So is the child playing the part, or are her memories real? Through a translator, Kyle questions her about relatives from her previous life. Can she remember any other name? Başka isim hatırlıyor musun Okan, Hakan, Lamia? Başka hiç isim hatırlıyor musun? Ha? Sadece Ayfer. Only Ayfer. Kimde Ayfer? Kimde Ayfer? Ayfer benim kardeşim. I felt was my sister. <laughs> Demet's mother also believes. We were in a group of about 20 people traveling in a bus to the seaside. My husband was driving. My brother Mehmet was with us as well. Demet was sitting in between us. 10 kilometers before Chevlik, she suddenly got very upset. She was shaking and crying. My brother put his arm around her and asked what on earth was going on. Her voice was trembling and she was terrified. She said, this is where we had the accident. Her mother supports the little girl and Demet is sticking to her story. Sen de nereden biliyorsun çevlikte öldüğünü? Ha? Kim dedi sana çevlikte öldü? She said she died in çevlik. So I asked her who told you that you died in çevlik. She said I know myself. The family belong to the Avalite sect of Islam, a group that deviates from the religion in one major way. They believe in reincarnation. For the local Imam, Demet's rebirth is an act of God. This is a God-given talent, a God-given gift. It mainly happens to people who die in accidents. They drown or they get shot. These are the people who talk to us the most. But it seems inevitable that anyone brought up in this belief system would be influenced by the views expressed around her. And for the others, a child like Demet is a reaffirmation of their faith. Chris French believes the setting and background are all important in these cases. What happens is this provides a kind of context in which the development of false memories, so the children actually come to believe they really did have these past lives, is likely to happen. Yet Demet claims to remember all the details of the fatal crash. Kyle visits Aifa Kapi, sister of the dead girl, who was also in the accident, and who also has memories. The person who died I crawled out of the car and could hear that they had found her, quite far away from the place where the accident happened, near a canal. Her mobile phone and her cigarettes were still lying there. She was bleeding badly from her head, and you could see the inside of her skull. And then? 
Then I bumped into a stone. My vein popped out. Something had burst. Then I got smaller and smaller. Is this four-year-old really remembering her own death? Finally, Aifa Kapi meets the little girl who claims to be her sister reborn. The girls stare at each other. But Demet shows little interest in her beloved sister from earlier times. She plays like a normal four-year-old, but with no sign of recognition. But Aifa also believes in reincarnation. and sees her dead sister's soul in the little girl's eyes. The results of Kyle's work in Turkey are sent back to the university department in Charlottesville. But like so many of his cases, the conclusions are very unclear. Children need fantasies, and we should have kindness to children to see their fantasy as fantasies, and we should be able to laugh at it and we should be able to encourage to grow their fantasies. But don't put too much things, big things like reincarnation on that thing. That's cruelty to children for small vested interests. In the early 1970s, faced with criticism from other academics, Stevenson called in lawyer Champy Ransom to examine his methods and findings. I worked there for about uh, three years, 72, about 73, a little less than three years. And it was interesting because uh, w we were studying, uh, studying whether, whether these amazing um, uh, phenomena were, were actually real. And I think trying to study it in a serious way, not just accepting it or rejecting it, but but trying to find out whether there was any, any evidence for these things. Ransom examined the method and conditions under which children were interviewed. He analyzed how objective the questioning had been to see if they could have been given subtle cues and hints. His findings cast doubt on Stevenson's results. I never saw a single case that I thought was that would sort of stop you in your tracks and say, all of my questions about eyewitness testimony and going back to things that were said years ago and, and having the two families exchange information and so forth, all of that has to, doesn't fit this case, that this case overcomes those things. But for Stevenson, the idea that our personalities could stretch back beyond one lifetime raises curious questions about human behavior. Conventional psychology believes our personalities are shaped by genetic and environmental influences, by nature and nurture. Stevenson believes there are children whose behavior can't be explained by either and whose memories must be inherited in some way. I think there must be some vehicle in which, uh, which conveys the uh, memories of events and the uh, habits of behavior and the um, uh, birthmarks and birth defects when these occur. They, they can't, I think, uh, just occur from one to the other instantly. There must be some, some intermediate uh, carrier in 1942, the Japanese army attacked Burma, killing and torturing thousands. Stevenson claims to have found many Burmese children who are reincarnations of the hated invaders. He recognizes them by their uncharacteristic behavior. And yet they are full of Japanese trays. They want uh, strong tea with sugar and they want raw fish. Uh, they complain about the heat in Burma and they often go around without any top because it's so hot for them. His report on these strange children has yet to be published, 
and psychologist Chris French finds his ideas hard to accept. Although it's an intriguing idea that maybe past lives could actually have an influence upon current personality development, I think most researchers working in that area would feel that although there's an awful lot we don't know about how personality develops, that ultimately the explanation will be in terms of nature and nurture, of genetics and the environment, and that we won't need to invoke the influences of past lives. But the romance of reincarnation is too strong to be overcome by scientists or skeptics. Fifty years ago, the sleepy town of Pueblo, Colorado, found itself the center of a storm. In 1952, Maury Bernstein began a hypnosis experiment with Ginny Tai, the wife of his business partner. Joe Bullen was present at the sessions. I was the person uh, doing what your gentlemen are doing here, holding, doing the taping and, and assisting in the interviews. Now we're going to turn back. We're going to turn back through time and space, just like turning back in the pages of a book. And when I next talk to you, when I next talk to you, when I next talk to you, you will be seven years old, and you will be able to answer my questions. Do you go to school? Yes. Yeah. All right. Who sits in front of you? Huh. Jack on. Well, now is the time. And he said, now go back to when you were three. Go back to when you were two. Go back to when you were one and even younger, go way back, way back in time. Go back to another time, another place, and tell me what you see. Now you're going to tell me what scenes came into your mind. What did you see? What did you see? Oh, scratch the paint off of my bed. Just painted it and Made it pretty. It was a metal bed. I scratched the paint off of it. Dug my nails on every post and just ruined it. This is terrible. Why did you do that? I don't know. I was just mad. An awful spanking. Maury was really astounded himself at this point because here was obviously a whole nother personality. It had nothing to do with Jenny Ty. And so he regathered himself and started asking questions and found that she lived in Ireland around the year 1800 and that, uh, and that he brought her up through hypnosis to being older and describing her life. In the same year, Bernstein published a book about the sessions. In it, he said that under hypnosis, Ginny Tai could vividly remember her previous life in 19th century Ireland. Back then, her name was Bridie Murphy. Her story became a bestseller. She was headlines in all the newspapers, and Hollywood was quick to cash in. Now you're as far back as your memory can go. Can you still see yourself? Yes. Do you still know what your name is? Uh-huh. Bridie. Your name is what? Bridie. Well, don't you have any other names? Bridie Murphy. Well, where do you live? In Cork. What? Well, what is the name of the country in which you live? It's Ireland. Ireland. Overnight, the hypnotist and his subject became famous nationwide. Bernstein was inundated with stories from other people who wanted him to tell the world of their previous lives. Bridie Murphy even had her own fan clubs. Brett Bezona is a self-confessed admirer. You know, 
if you believe in reincarnation, the Bridie Murphy thing, yeah, <laughs> no doubt. If you don't, you can find ways to dissect it, you know, as the skeptics did. And, you know, some people would call it a hoax. A hypnotic subject. When asked, for example, go back into your childhood and childhood and childhood, and then go back to the previous birth, if he believes in reincarnation, he would say something. But you can also make a person convinced that he's a dog and ask him to bark and he will bark. That does not mean that he's a dog. Keen to uncover the truth, the Denver Post sent a journalist to Ireland to investigate Ginny's story. The results were a blow to believers. None of her countless memories of Bridie Murphy could be verified, and many were wrong. Her vivid accounts of life a hundred years ago were rich in convincing detail. Surely she couldn't have lied under hypnosis. Now the problem is that people think that hypnosis is some kind of a magical key to unlock repressed or hidden memories, either from their own past or even from a past life. But in actual fact, what hypnosis does is to provide a context whereby we actually end up producing some kind of a story, a narrative that's based on imagination, beliefs, expectation, and bits of knowledge that we've picked up from various places, weaving all that together and then believing that what we are saying refers to events that actually really did happen. It's the ideal, perfect tool for producing false memories. She didn't want to be hypnotized anymore. And one of her quotes was uh, in the Pueblo paper, you know, if I had known then what I know now, I would have never laid down on that couch. In spite of all the criticisms, many still claim to believe in her. She's certainly the most famous person ever to come out of Pueblo. And as the town's biggest tourist attraction, much appreciated. And there are places in the world where reincarnation rules supreme. Amidst the heavenly peaks of the Himalayas, Tibetan Buddhism has flourished for over a thousand years. Reincarnation has been an accepted part of that life for centuries, as His Holiness the Dalai Lama, himself a living God, explains. If you accept this, if you life continuation of life, then death it's just it's a one occasion. Like you see, they're changing your, your when your clothes become I said the old, and then you see the the old clothes you see uh, uh, throw away and take you see new nice nice you see clothes. Similarly, this old body uh, uh, cannot function properly. Then change the new body, more energetic, more more fresh body. Tibetan Buddhists believe that Buddha, their god, is reborn through countless generations in the human form of the Dalai Lama. This unshaken belief means that Tibetan Buddhists accept that memories and experiences can be passed on intact from one body to another. Professor Philip Sharp is less sure. You have to, to picture that the beginning of a human being is a single cell which then divides and makes two and then changes its character to make neurons for the brain and then organizes the brain by external experience. And recording within that process uh, a specific memory uh, would be uh, hard to picture. Reincarnation may fly in the face of science, but is central to Tibetan society. Many of the senior leaders are accepted as the current reincarnation of earlier rulers. Robert Thurman is a Buddhist specialist at Columbia University. The view of reincarnation was in Buddhist societies always, everywhere. So when we talk about reincarnation, we mean the official social recognition and indeed the preservation of a property, of a residence, sometimes of a monastery and disciples, of a particular lama. It's almost like you re-inhabit your old bank account. Finding the new god is a complex process. In 1933, the 13th Dalai Lama died. Lama, 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 Lama. 
the government were faced with the task of appointing a successor. But in a country that is the size of Western Europe, how would they locate him in his new body? First, the monks must fast and meditate at Lake Lazo. Clues come to them in visions which direct them to their reincarnated leader. In 1937, a party of the former Dalai Lama's associates, disguised as peasants, followed the visions and located a two-year-old child, Tenzin Gyatso. He was immediately put to the test. The child recognized objects that belonged to the former Dalai Lama and greeted the associates as if they were old friends. He had passed. In 1940, the 14th Dalai Lama was enthroned a tradition that serves a secular as well as religious purpose. And the monastics are celibate, they don't have children. How is the succession going to work? It's not going to be easy. You know, the charisma, the charisma of the dynasty and the little crown prince and all that has a certain charisma. So the reincarnation institution can replace that charisma very effectively. But the institution is under threat. In 1950, the Chinese occupied Tibet, forcing its leader into exile. The monasteries were closed, the monks forced out. For 50 years, Tibetans have struggled to keep their beliefs alive. Their resistance has been so strong that even their Chinese occupiers may have to bow to the system. This Dalai Lama has said that if he does die in exile, he will definitely take reincarnation in exile. He will not take reincarnation under the political authority of the Chinese. The Chinese then can try to pretend that they found one, but no Tibetans will accept that. Today, the Indian town of Dharamsala is home to the exiled Dalai Lama. From here, he has sent out secret search parties to ensure that reincarnated leaders are correctly identified without Chinese intervention. The indication or indication must come from the, uh, from the boy or the girl. First, let them clearly demonstrate their memory, their ability. If that's quite satisfactory, but then on the, on the basis of these how to say, factor, then choose, then decide. So that's the, that's the proper way. Here is a living system based entirely upon belief in the rebirth of the soul. The future may be uncertain for Tibetans, but their beliefs will live on. If you look, look at death as a part of life, birth, illness, old age, and death is part of our life. Uh, and then also, you see, much, uh, much depend, you see, your concept about future life. If you accept, if you believe, if you accept, you see, future life, continuation of life, then death is just, you see, one occasion. Mm -hmm.